Hello people and welcome back to my series on programming paradigms. In this video I'm going to take a look at the functional programming paradigm. It's become quite popular over the past several years and the reason why is it offers uh, several interesting benefits for programming over the traditional programming methods such as object-oriented programming and uh, procedural programming. Uh, the big idea, or one of the big ideas behind functional programming is pure functions. And so a, a function can be thought of as just a box, and we have an input and an output. So if we have some value that goes in, and we have some value that comes out, and that's it. So in, in functional programs, it has essentially the pure mathematical uh, definition of a function where you have an input and an output. In other, uh, in other programming paradigms, you can actually have uh, much more than this. So you can do things like change x when you feed it into the function. So not only do you get, an I, uh, get a y out, but you can also change the value of x. There's also the possibility of, of having, say, another variable like g, that's a terrible g, but you can have a g that gets changed by your function when you run it, even though you never passed g in. And that's called a side effect of where a function changes something outside of itself. But functional programs only have inputs and outputs, and they never change what their inputs are. So let's take a look at an example of that. And here's an, a very simple example that I put together in C++ where I have a pure function and an impure function. The pure function takes in a number and returns its increment, and the impure function takes in a number, it increments it, and it also returns that same number. So in, for testing it, what we do is we create a number and assign one and then we can run our pure function by giving it our number and getting out number a and then we print out both the number and our number a then we can run our impure function with our number and get number b and we print out both of those so let's go ahead and do that and see what happens so let's do g++ uh, use the c++ 14 standard and use func1 cpp it compiles and when we run it we see that after we run our pure function, our number that we put in stays the same, and we get an output of 2. And for our impure function, it actually changes our original value of num, which used to be 1, but now is 2 after it passes through our function. And then we get 2 out as the result for number b. And so that's, that's one of the major differences or one of the major ideas behind functional programming is that we have only pure functions, so we don't go and change any of the variables that we pass in. And we also don't do any, any special uh, changes to variables outside either. So for example, if we have int g equals 0, doing this, g++, that is an example of a side effect. So in functional programming, we don't have any side effects. Another powerful idea behind functional programming is not only can we have values uh, that we pass in to our functions, but we can also pass in and return functions to our functions. So functions are first class citizens in, in functional programming languages. So we can pass in a function and we can return functions. And that's a very powerful tool for functional programming because it allows us to create what are called higher order functions which can uh, take in functions and return functions. And let's take a look at an example of that now. I wrote another program called func2.js and it's in JavaScript because C++ doesn't truly support first-class functions. So here's a function called multiple, and it takes a number in called multiplier, and it returns a function where we multiply our multiplier by x. So, we, so if we use this uh, multiple function, and we say multiple 2, 
then what we do is we create a function that will double any number that we put in. So we can test that by having a, uh, we can put in a number, say three, and so we, if we double three, we should get six. And, we, and hopefully when we print that out, that's the answer we'll get. So that's an example of returning a function. So this, so this function actually returns a function. Uh, we can also pass in functions as an argument to a function, and there's a very popular uh, functional uh, pattern that's used called map. So I've created a version called my map, which takes in a function and an array, and for each element in the array, it applies the function to it, and then returns uh, a new array that has uh, all those new elements with the function applied. And so we use it by just getting a result b and using my map, and we just pass in a function called double that we created before, and we pass in an array with some numbers, and then we should, uh, what this should do is it should double every number. So let's try that out, node func2, and indeed that's what we get. So for our first example, we did get double three, which is six. In our second example, we did double every number in our array, and we passed a new array. Uh, the final idea that I want to cover in this video for functional programming is referential transparency. And the idea behind referential transparency is that it's just a fancy way of saying that uh, there are no such things as variables in functional programming. So in normal programming languages, we, we have a variable say, let's say a, which was three before, and we can later on say a equals five. Well, in functional programming, you can't do that. So once a is set, then it's set forever in that program. If you want to create a new value, if, uh, then you have to change it. So you have to uh, create a new variable, say uh, c, and make it uh, double A. Uh, so you can't you can't change uh, so you don't have variables. You just can't change whatever you've assigned. Uh, also, that goes for data structures too. So if we have something like a person, and the person has say a name, say it's John, and a favorite number, say seven, we can pass around this person uh, all throughout our program and it will, and we know that it will never change its value. So we, we can never change the, uh, this variable, uh, the name or the number. And that may seem, seem kind of restrictive and maybe wasteful because it's like, okay, if I have say a huge object and I just want to change one thing in there, say we've got John and we've got his address, his favorite number, his age, uh, the color of his hair, his eyes, and we just want to change one thing, we just want to change the favorite number, we have to create a whole new person with all the same stuff except with the new number. So that may seem kind of wasteful, but it allows for some very powerful uh, programming techniques. So for example, one of the most difficult things to do in programming is to have a uh, safe and bug-free parallel programming. And the reason why that is very difficult is because you have to worry about changing data. So you have to worry about variables that change over time. And in order to make computation with changing variables safe, you, you normally have to put locks around them. So you have to put a special lock that, uh, that prevents other threads and processes from changing the variables that you share, the references you share. And if, if you're never allowed to change a variable, if we say C always stays the same value forever and A stays the same value forever, well then we could have hundreds or thousands of threads that, that all reference A and C and person, and we don't have to worry. We don't have to have any locks. We don't have to have any special logic to prevent uh, changes from happening uh, out of sync with, with other things. 
and that's a very very powerful thing and that that can re that can remove an entire class of bugs from programming and it makes parallel programming far easier now of course there are downsides it, it, it is quite wasteful to have to create an entirely new object every time you want to change a little thing and there are programming languages like Clojure that have um, that have workarounds for this that they have designed their data structures uh, specifically so that they save space and they can actually share space with the things that don't change and uh, so those are the major ideas behind functional programming there's actually several other things as well but they aren't used very much in modern programming languages in uh, languages like Java and C Sharp and even C++ they've started to add features that give us things that are close to uh, first-class functions and give, give us things um, and, and we can use things like const to help us uh, not have uh, changing variables and things like that and so but so those are the things I've covered are essentially the three major things that that other languages have started to adopt in their uh, programming languages so that is about it for functional programming thank you for watching till next time.